Good morning and welcome to To The Point. This morning, we have two members of the House of Representatives, one Republican, one Democrat, both from Muskegon County. Both serve on the Appropriations Committee. And we're talking about just that, appropriations and auto no-fault insurance. We start with Republican Greg Van Workum. First of all, Representative, thanks for being with us. I want to start as I do. Here we are uh, all five months into this process, and I still haven't gotten all the new representatives. That's okay. Uh, That's but, okay. But thank you for coming in and doing this. You are a freshman, but if your name sounds familiar, it's because uh, Van Workham before you has also served in the House, and yes. I should point out the Senate, and that was your father, Gerald Van Yep. Workham. So my dad first ran for this seat, the 91st District, in 1998. Served two terms in the State House and then two terms in the State Senate, finishing up in 2010. And I should point out he was there for Inauguration Day and was a proud father, so congratulations Thank to you. him. Thank uh, you. Let's talk a little bit about your history. What brought you to this point? Obviously, you have some family history, but you've also been very involved uh, in the legislative process from another standpoint. Yes. So I've been involved in public policy. Uh, I was out in D.C. for seven and a half years working for Congressman Pete Hoekstra and was his senior policy advisor uh, over many different formulations of the government, whether it was a Republican president or a Democrat president, a uh, Republican House or a Democrat House. So I've seen just about every iteration of uh, my time in D.C. and then uh, moved back and became the district director for Congressman Bill Heisinger and did a lot of his local outreach uh, for him for eight years. So I've been in the community, have been around, have been in the public policy fear, sphere for a while now. And so uh, it's important to point out that your district lies within that congressional district yes. to the northern part of it. Yes. So you're back in uh, what is your home district. You've taken on this role and now you find yourself once again in divided government. You talked about it a little bit in D.C. and this past week we have seen a real example of how divided government makes it more difficult to get some things done. Before we talk about the specifics of this week, what has your take been in these first few months? Because the first right. day I remember uh, you said we'll see, see what happens, see how it develops, because it's impossible to know. Even if you have experience, even if you've been around it, every session is different. And this session, much different from the last eight years, where Republicans were in control of most of the levers of government in Lansing, the same is not true now. Yeah, for a lot of people, it's been kind of the status quo for the past eight years where uh, you didn't have a divided government, now we do. Um, you know, there is still that wait and see. I think uh, for the first couple months, everyone was kind of feeling each other out and figuring uh, what bu buttons could be pushed and what could be done. Uh, but now, as we'll probably talk about a little bit later, there's some major items that are top priority for our caucus, top priority for the governor, and how we go about and actually get those things passed and get those things done. So. Um, and with term limits, you have new leadership in there each time, uh, new players at the table each time. So I think that kind of complicates, kind of gets things moving, maybe a little bit slower. Um, but uh, it's been interesting. Uh, it will remain interesting. It's uh, always a, uh, a challenge. Um, uh, for the thought process and everything else, uh, how to get that done, strategically speaking. Yeah, well, and but it's also, and you make a really good point, because there are new players in every position, a governor, a lieutenant governor, to a lesser degree when it comes to legislative activity, an attorney general and a secretary of state, a new Senate majority leader, a new Senate minority, uh, I, I'm mistaken, that's the only player yeah. that remained the same was the Senate minority leader, a new Speaker of the House, and a new House minority leader. So everybody is still just getting used to, to everybody, even in the quadrant meetings. So there have been days when it looked to me like things were moving very, very slow. But in the past few days, particularly over in the Senate side where I've been spending a little more time, uh, they've moved a lot of zero budgets out. So the budget process is moving along. Where are you in the House? You're on the Appropriations Committee, yep. and that, of course, is where that all begins. Yep, so I do serve on the Appropriations Committee. I have the fortune of being the chairman of the Agriculture and Rural Development Committee. We have passed our budget through full appropes. Uh, we've passed, uh, I would guess, about 10 of those budgets through full appropes, and a couple more coming up uh, next week. Uh, we've got the, a major one that passed. Uh, subcommittee, which I serve on, the 
Department of Health and Human Services, That's which actually makes up half of the state government. $25 billion is within the Department of Health and Human Services. So we're making some steady progress on that. Um, and the Senate as well is making progress on their side. And then you come to that conference committee and you try and hash out uh, those details. And the added difficulty is you have your budget, they have their budget, and the governor has her budget priorities. And as of the time we're sitting here right now, unless uh, something happened uh, in legislative session today that I missed, uh, the ask for 45 cent per gallon gas tax increase has still not been introduced in either chamber as far as I know. Nope, no uh, Republican or Democrat has introduced that legislation. Which seems to me is going to make it difficult to get a transportation budget done if the governor is making her ass assessments based on that. So that is still a battle to come before the budgets get done, isn't it? That will remain a discussion topic in that um, with the governor's recommendation there was a lot of shifting of dollars based on a 45 cent gas tax increase. Um, it related to education, uh, it related to higher ed, uh, as well as local revenue sharing. So um, our budget is looking more at last year's budget and what the current spending is um, compared to the governor's recommendation of having those additional uh, two point five billion dollars to play with. We just don't see that happening as a part of that budget process at this point. Um, but as you see, uh, there's a lot of surprises that uh, happen during the week and you just have to be prepared and flexible for that. Well, as a practical matter, you can't allocate two point five billion dollars that doesn't exist. So uh, the Constitution would not allow that. But we also know that the governor made her budget recommendations based on that, and that's the pulling the nine hundred million dollar or nine hundred thousand dollars back and forth that you talked about, moving those things around. So all of that is yet to come, and we'll see what that incarnation looks like. You talked about this week, and it was an interesting week, starting uh, late last week when the Senate, uh, somewhat surprisingly just developed a no-fault plan. It had been out there for a while. Uh, Eric Nesbitt over in the Senate had been working on it. I think he was anxious to get it introduced. They introduced it. They passed it. Couldn't get immediate effect. Uh, effect. Uh, at one point, it moved back and forth. The whole idea is uh, that that's their plan. The House has their plan. Yep. Um, the House plan goes further, from my perspective. It, it, it includes more things that some on the other side of the aisle said they wanted, yet the governor said she'll veto either one of them. So where are we with auto no fault? We are, one, um, you brought up a good point, in that the Senate bill and the House bill are different. Um, and that needs to be reiterated. That, um, and I think there was a lot of confusion yet uh, last week about that, uh, as I heard some of the speeches on the floor uh, last week. Um, I, th I believe, and you'll see some information coming out this weekend and today, of how the Senate and the House are trying to negotiate in good faith with the governor. Uh, we've seen the proposals that the governor has asked. Uh, we incorporated, incorporated several of those in the House version. And then you see more that the governor is asking. So we're curious about whether the goalposts are being moved on this. But bottom line is that the House passed a version of auto no fault reform, which hasn't happened in 30, 40 years. It's always been the House that's been the one that couldn't get it done. When for so many years, constituents have asked and asked repeatedly and have told us repeatedly that the cost of car insurance is too high in the state. We lead the nation on premiums. We have to come up with a solution. Our constituents are asking for it. The House has finally gotten a version through, and now we're trying to work in good faith with the governor on what are those provisions that she's seeking so that she can sign it and provide that relief to, to Michigan drivers. I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but one of the things that struck me in the Senate plan was they had a six-month uh, moratorium so insurance companies could get up to speed once it was implemented, but it wouldn't be implemented until this session is over. So we're re we were really looking effectively if the Senate bill had been passed over in the Senate, uh, in the House, and if the governor had signed it, neither of those things has happened, uh, it wouldn't have been implemented until sometime 
in 2022. Okay. Uh, so. I bring that up not because that's necessarily how it ultimately plays out, but there's not going to be a quick fix. This isn't going to happen immediately unless you come up with a really big agreement where you can get immediate effect um, and get the governor to sign it. And, and that will be a lot of negotiation, I assume. Yeah, I think our goal is immediate effect. We want to deliver results and the cost savings immediately to drivers that when they need to go to that next policy, they will have a sit down with their insurance agent and see the options that are available and the costs associated with those options. Uh, I think that's a goal for us uh, to, to provide that relief as soon as possible. In the house plan, you offer several different levels of service. There are critics that say, look, uh, people are naturally gonna go for the least expensive leaving them vulnerable when it comes to health care. The governor was in Grand Rapids this week at a trauma center, driving home the point that if you don't have the right coverage, you don't get that kind of treatment. Is that a concern for you and your constituents? It's a concern for our caucus, is that we want to make sure that there's options available for people. Our caucus was very specific on that unlimited benefit. So we continue to require an unlimited benefit be provided to uh, to Michigan drivers. Um, but if there's the option on your personal health care that you have that accident coverage, you are in essence double charging on that uh, component. So um, you got to, I guess, we're asking people to take a look what fits for them, what fits for their family, what are those needs and what kind of options and coverage do you need? It's going to be a little bit of personal responsibility on that, um, but we want to make sure that people have the coverage that, that they need. And I, I think um, some insurance agents, maybe all, maybe it will become a best practice to recommend that unlimited package. That's the view from the Republican side, but Democrats have a different plan for auto no-fault insurance and a different idea about budgeting. We'll examine that when we come back with Representative Terry Sabo, a Democrat from Muskegon, next to The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. This morning we're talking to two members of the House of Representatives. You just heard from the Republican. Now, Democrat Terry Sabo of Muskegon talks about how the House process is moving along with budgeting and auto no-fault insurance. Representative, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in Lansing. You're on the Appropriations Committee. You're also on a special committee that the Speaker set up dealing with auto no fault. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's talk a little bit about appropriations. Budgets have started to move. Where are we in that process? Uh, well, the, uh, the subcommittees are reporting out their budgets uh, really as we speak. Um, there's been a majority of them have already come out. Uh, we still have a handful of them to go on the House side. Um, so we're still uh, monitoring that and seeing how that plays out. And when those are all done, you'll get together with the Senate. You'll all decide what your priorities are. Uh, they'll be voted through, sent back and forth. And then you got to get concurrence from the governor. And that may be where the biggest obstacle will lie between the legislature uh, and the governor in divided government trying to get these together. How? much difficulty are you having in the subcommittee process, or if any, getting these budgets passed out? Are they pretty much party line? Uh, yeah, for the most part, they are coming across as uh, party line uh, votes. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been really disturbing, at least from my perspective as a Democrat, to see some of the cuts that are being put into place um, and are being recommended in the House subcommittee budgets. Uh, massive cuts to several of the different departments, really to a point of I think putting our, our uh, departments and our state in jeopardy, especially when it comes to some of the IT cuts that we have um, at, at a time when we are so dependent upon the, you know, the uh, information technology systems that are in place um, to provide not only security but customer service. Um, massive cuts there that are really going to cause some problems for our department down the road. Uh, we'll talk about where these cuts are. You talk about IT. Are you talking about across the board in all departments? Yes, that's correct. For the most part, all departments that we're seeing in the House versions of the budget. And, uh, and again, that's very concerning to me. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, handcuffing our departments for the most part um, so that they really aren't going to be able to do their jobs completely um, as our residents would expect them to do. And, uh, and then again, that is disturbing and I think that uh, we really need to take a different look. We're leaving a lot of money on the table. For some reason, there's, uh, 
you know, all these massive cuts are going into place, and we're leaving millions upon millions of dollars uh, that it's going unused. Well, help me understand then, if um, the Revenue Estimating Conference suggests there is so much money that will be coming in, so you're saying that these budgets that are being passed are leaving money unspent? That's correct. And, and what would the purpose of that be? Uh, that's probably a question for, uh, for somebody else or for uh, Republican leadership uh, because that's where these cuts are coming from. It's from uh, the Republican side of the, uh, of the, of the budgets. And, um, and again, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, that's an unanswered question to me at this point. And, uh, and I'd certainly like to know the reason why, because again, we're, we're putting our, our residents, not only their safety when it comes to their, uh, their, their security of being online, but also with uh, the department's ability to do their jobs. One of the, the things that jumps immediately to mind is that money being held back might be used to backfill in transportation, because we know the transportation uh, budget as it has been passed uh, on both ends of the Capitol is not going to meet the muster of the governor. She wants that uh, increase in uh, gasoline tax at 45 cents. But what she really wants is 2.5 billion extra dollars to go into transportation. So is, is it possible that some of that money is, is kind of being held in advance to, to maybe end up with a budget deal? Well, you know, that's a great question, and I wish I did have the answer to it. <laughs> Me too. Uh, but, you, yeah. know, the, you know, the majority uh, party is, has, really has control over that, and uh, for whatever reason, it seems that they're um, trying to stockpile money at the expense of the other departments uh, being able to do their jobs. Well, so which departments do you think are in danger in terms of financing? Because uh, we know Health and Human Services is the big chunk. Uh, we know that budget will always, uh, you know, have a certain amount of uh, finance to it. Uh, K-12, school, higher education, all of those things. Where, mm -hmm. where are the, the, the cuts that you think are the most serious? Uh, well, in my own uh, committee that I'm on, which is the General Government Committee, mm -hmm. and uh, that holds, uh, the subcommittee of General Government holds the budgets of the Attorney General, of the Governor's Office, of the Secretary of State, and, and many others. And that's where about $200 million was left on the table um, so that these across the board cuts, 3% across the board, 25% across the board for IT services, um, and then an additional cut uh, into the Attorney General's budget. And uh, so there's, there you go. I mean, there's tremendous cuts happening there. And, uh, and it's, again, it's just very concerning because we have all this money we're leaving on the table, um, and this is just money from the previous year's budget. And uh, for some reason, it seems to be more important for the majority to now make these cuts and to the to the departments when uh, when we really should be funding them at their at their at least at full level so that they can do their jobs how much of this do you think and and again i'm asking you to speculate because as you point mm -hmm. out uh, the republicans do hold the majority but how much of this is budgeting and how much of this is about the proclivity of the majority not to be in sync with the Secretary of State or the Attorney General. Yeah, unfor you know, my speculation, uh, unfortunately, would lead me to believe that there are other plans in place um, in an attempt to not have to go back and try to find new revenue. Um, it's been made very clear, I think, from from people of both sides of the aisle that new revenue is needed. Uh, but for whatever reason, we're we're seem to be going back to reverting uh, to a to a practice of of a shell game, basically, of moving money around. And, uh, and trying to, to put patchwork on major problems in our state. And, uh, and I don't think that's going to be the way to do it. It has not worked for the last several years. And um, somebody is going to have to come to the realization that we have to increase our revenue if we want to um, fix some of the big problems that we have in our state. You're in your second term uh, as a state representative, and you can run for one more. I assume you will. You don't have to divulge that here. <laughs> is it your estimation that the people of the state of Michigan, and specifically the people in your district, will accept an increase in the sales tax, uh, I'm sorry, in the gasoline tax, a fuel tax, um, in exchange for roads that won't be seen noticeably better for probably half a decade. I mean, 45 cents on a gallon, I've done the, the math for me, mm -hmm. it isn't, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't 
preclude me from doing some of the things I would want to do, but it is still 45 cents. Mm -hmm. is, is that palatable to your, to well, your constituents? You know, I think uh, the people of my district want to see some of these problems solved. And, uh, and I think they realize that there are uh, revenue shortages in our state that are causing some problems. And they've been led to believe one thing, that problems are being solved, when in fact that they're really not. It's, it's again, going back to this shell game um, of moving money around to try to patchwork uh, different problems, or, or what I refer to as uh, putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. It's, uh, it's not working, and I think our, my residents in, in the 92nd District of Muskegon and the, and the area, they want to see these problems resolved, and they want to see some, some solutions to the problems as far as how do we go about doing it. And uh, so far, the governor is the only one that's come out with a solution. Um, nobody else has from uh, the, the majority parties of either the Senate or the House. And, um, and that's where we stand now. I believed some months ago that there might be a grand bargain in the works. And that would have been reducing the cost of auto insurance in exchange for raising the, the gasoline tax. And the reason I thought that might work is because I heard some conversations among some of the leadership that led me uh, down that path. Instead, what we have is no movement at all on a gas tax, hasn't even been introduced in either body, and two separate bills on auto no-fault. Now, you're not only on appropriations, but you're on that mm -hmm. special committee the speaker set up. Uh, for auto no fault. So tell me where we are on that because that seems to be a big part of the component right now. Well, when it comes to the, uh, to the, to the uh, auto no fault situation, I don't think there's anybody that would say that uh, rates are not a problem. Um, you know, we, we really have a problem with our auto insurance rates here in Michigan. And the Speaker of the House laid out um, a plan in, well, involving the, uh, the chair, uh, Representative Wentworth, um, to head up this committee to look into this problem and with no preconceived notions on how we were going to get it solved. And I went into that committee process with an open mind as what was requested. And I really believe that that process was working. Uh, we were finding real solutions, um, working in a bipartisan way. And I thought we were definitely headed in the right direction. And then out of nowhere, last week, um, the Senate had their uh, auto no-fault bill um, came across to us in the House and uh, there was uh, seemed to be some haste in moving forward with either that or another version um, that totally bypassed the committee that we were on and, um, and unfortunately we ended up holding a vote and, and it passed. Now the, of course the governor has threatened a veto on that and, uh, and there's talks go ongoing so hopefully we're headed um, you know, into some sort of a, a discussion that's going to solve this problem. But, but again, I thought we were already on that path, and as it turns out, we were not. Uh, we're going to be completely out of time. What would you, as uh, the lone member, I mean, I, I get it, there are 110 of you, but mm -hmm. uh, if you could just say one thing that you wanted in that package or wanted out of that package, what would you want it to look like? Uh, I want guaranteed rate relief uh, for the long term, not for the short term. And that's something that's really crucial for me to see because uh, we don't need to see another uh, fake uh, solution to a problem. We need to have a real solution and one that's truly bipartisan, not just picking off one or two members, but something that is very bipartisan so that all the special interest groups know that if they're going to try to negotiate this or try to work on something, they're going to have to negotiate with all 110 people in the House, not just half or, or a, a close majority. When we come back, another look at auto no fault insurance and where we go from here next to the point. The quest to reform auto no fault insurance will continue in Lansing. Will it be part of a larger solution that includes something like a gas tax and budgets? We don't know, but we do know the conversation continues and we'll be following it every Sunday morning right here to the point.